Good evening and welcome, everyone. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, members of our foundation's board of directors, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for joining us this evening. Let me first acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, WBUR and the Boston Globe. We considered having this forum last night on the actual 50th anniversary of Mrs. Kennedy's tour, but did not want to make any of you choose, have to choose between sharing Valentine's Day with loved ones or with your friends here at the Kennedy Library. So we're so pleased to have so many of you here with us this evening. 50 years ago, Jacqueline Kennedy introduced herself to the nation. In many ways, the public already knew Mrs. Kennedy through her role as the president's wife, mother of two children, and as the woman who charmed world leaders like Khrushchev and de Gaulle. But on February 14, 1962, it was a more substantive Jacqueline Kennedy who guided viewers on a televised tour of the White House, and the nation was transfixed. 46 million Americans watched that night, and an additional 10 million tuned in days later. The reviews were laudatory, mis describing Mrs. Kennedy as a virtuoso performer and an art critic of subtlety and standard. My favorite anecdote relates to the evening of the day Mrs. Kennedy had spent taping the tour. After dinner, she and President Kennedy watched some outtakes with friends. Seeing how his wife had clearly outshined him in her portion, Compared to the final clip in which he appeared, the president asked CBS if it would be possible to reshoot his segment the following morning. <laughs> Essentially, he followed the same script the next day, but tried admirably to match his wife's charm, ease, and engaging presence. You can decide how well he does when we watch that clip in a moment. Tonight, we'll watch a portion of the tour, and then it'll be our great honor to hear from the current White House curator, William Allman. It's often said that nice guys finish last, especially in our nation's capital, but Bill Allman is a wonderful exception to that rule. Mr. Allman became curator of the White House on August 1, 2002, having served as a curatorial assistant and then assistant curator since 1976. No one has done more in recent years to help preserve the White House and its historic collections while also helping to update them to our times. We're delighted he is here with us this evening. After the film, Mr. Allman will give a brief slideshow presentation about the White House, and then I'll moderate a conversation with him, during which time we welcome your questions. Three quick notes. We'll be ending a bit early to ensure that Mr. Allman catches his plane back to DC. You can own your own copy of Mrs. Kennedy's tour, buying it outright in our museum store, which will be open after the forum. And for a limited time only, if you make a purchase in the store or via our e-store, we're giving away free copies uh, to mark the 50th anniversary. And this coming weekend, CBS Sunday Morning will air a story on Mrs. Kennedy and the White House tour, and I hope you all will tune in to that. As you know, Mrs. Kennedy was one of the founders of this library. It was her great hope that we would be a vital center of education and exchange which would grow and change with the times. I believe our forums, programs, and exhibits continue to be guided by her spirit, and I hope live up to the standard she set in her virtuoso performance 50 years ago. Let's relive that moment now together. A tour of the White House with Mrs. John F. Kennedy, created and produced by CBS News for the CBS Television Network. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. 
Do I need to use this? Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do for a few minutes is bring a little color to a black and white TV pic uh, show. Um, some color pictures of how those rooms looked when Mrs. Kennedy was doing it. Uh, and then some pictures of how the rooms have changed since that time. Because I think Mrs. Kennedy would have been the very first person to say to everyone that what she was doing was a first step uh, when she was asking people to donate things. Uh, now maybe the very best things weren't what was being offered at the time, but when she had nothing, you took lots of things that were offered. And uh, so there have been improvements to the collection, growth in the collection. That's clearly what she expected every first lady and president and first family to do was to contribute to the house uh, remaining a museum and, and growing and becoming more uh, interesting to the public. You see here the White House and uh, a picture of Mrs. Kennedy uh, during her, uh, the televised taping, a color picture, still picture that was taken showing her in the blue room. Uh, one of the things she, the president talked about was how many people had come to visit, that they had 1.3 million people in the year 1961. So it wasn't so much that this tour kicked off the interest in the White House. Mrs. Kennedy had already attracted the public attention. Uh, she was, she got early in 1961 a Congress to pass the law that she mentioned, which didn't just protect the collection, but it established that the museum character of the public rooms of the White House must be maintained in perpetuity with the, you know, it still has to function as a house for the family and the Secret Service still has a lot of say about the security issues. Uh, but the museum character was what she was so interested in grasping. Uh, then she created the curator's office, uh, in the, uh, also in 1961, with the idea that you needed a professional staff there to collect and preserve and interpret and conserve uh, the pieces that she found in the house uh, and the things that she was adding to the house. We actually have the dichotomy in our collection today. We still refer to the old collection, which was the stuff that Mrs. Kennedy found that had survived the 19th century auctions and the giving away of, of official furnishings. And then the new collection was everything she was collecting. But in fact, those things, for, to a large extent, were older than the things that she already had in the so-called old collection. But she had lots of people coming to the White House because she made the public aware that she was making it into a museum. It increased nationwide the interest in historic preservation and old houses and the contents of old houses. And so one of her early acquisitions, in fact, was this little engraving. Well, I'm not advancing after all of our conversations. There we go, sorry, wrong button. This, this 1840 engraving was acquired uh, as an archival object for the White House collection in 1961. And the, uh, the engraver actually entitled the piece, All Creation Going to the White House. Because even as early as 1840, they were envisioning that the public was attracted to the White House. Now in that period, it was attracted because people like Andrew Jackson were living in the building. Uh, but by 1961, Mrs. Kennedy gave the house a whole new level of attraction to the public as a historic site and a shrine to the presidency and a great uh, museum of important American objects. So following through her tour route, uh, basically, you'd see in the upper left-hand corner the East Room as she found it in 1961. Uh, not too much has changed uh, from what Theodore Roosevelt had done to the room in 1902 with the architects McKim, Mead, and White. The chandeliers, the tour shares, the cornices over the drapes, all dated from the 1902 period. Uh, you will see in this picture that the mantles are white. They are, in fact, red Numidian marble. Uh, but Mrs. Kennedy thought white was better, and so she painted them. Uh, and that was fine for a long time. They were difficult to keep white, uh, the, the paint chipped and, and such. Uh, and so you see in the lower right-hand corner today's East Room, uh, as it was refurbished uh, in the the 1990s, the red mantles have been restored to their original color because they matched the hearths and they matched the baseboards. Uh, there were no carpets in the room throughout the 19th century, but one of the things that First Lady uh, Barbara Bush had asked was that the room was so reverberant during parties that wasn't there a chance that we could have some carpets made. Uh, and so these were actually delivered early in the Clinton administration, but they're designed using the plaster work of the ceiling the very 18th century uh, English design feature of having carpets and ceilings reflect each other. 
uh, something that Mrs. Kennedy would have appreciated greatly. Uh, so it makes the room less uh, noisy, but it also takes away some of the opportunities that the children once had. The Theodore Roosevelt children were noted for roller skating around the room, uh, and subsequent children have had their attempts at uh, recreating the mayhem of the Theodore Roosevelt kids. Uh, but the room is still used, is still left largely unfurnished, and it's used for all sorts of parties uh, and entertaining. This would have been where the President and Mrs. Kennedy held the very famous dinner for the Nobel Prize winners uh, of, the, of, of the Americas, and President uh, Kennedy delivered the rather famous remark that I never quote quite correctly, but he said, never has so much talent been assembled in the White House except when Thomas Jefferson dined here alone. <laughs> Oops, now I'm wishing too fast. There we go. She pointed out the great portrait of George Washington by Gilbert Stuart. This is our iconic object that was hung on the walls when the house opened in 1800. It was saved by Dolly Madison from the fire. You might have noticed that, unfortunately, CBS News misspelled Dolly's name in the, uh, the, uh, the captions, whatever the, the subscript words there, it's D-O-L-L-E-Y. Uh, but this was the painting that was saved and restored and has been in the house continuously except for periods of construction. But I also point out to the right of this, Mrs. Kennedy acquired things not just for the public rooms. Uh, there were things that were acquired to be historical and interesting and archival. And some of them may have gone in storage, some of them may have gone in, in smaller rooms in the second and third floors of the house, uh, including this little uh, Windsor desk chair, which uh, came to us as the, it was in the temporary White House after the fire of 1814, the night that, the second night that James Madison was fleeing from the White House uh, after Dolly Madison had grabbed the painting and taken off in one direction and he took off in another direction and he basically was running the government for one night in Brookville, Maryland, sitting in this little uh, desk made by the owner of the house. Oops, I pushed too fast. She moved down the hall out of our normal tour route and got into the state dining room first. Uh, the picture at the upper left is how she would have found it. Um, the black marble mantelpiece is what was installed in the Truman renovation. It's really just a surround. The big 1902 mantle that she so much admired that it had the lion's heads carved on it, changed to bison heads, uh, was in fact removed by the, during the Truman renovation and sent to the Truman Library. So not to malign our cohorts at the Truman Library, but uh, Mrs. Kennedy actually invited them to send the mantle back. And <laughs> it wasn't the, the curator types, it was President Truman who said, no thank you, it's mine and I'm keeping it. Uh, and so what she was alluding to was that she was having the same, car the same firm, McKimmie and White via the same carving firm, uh, create a new white marble version of the gray stone mantle that had been installed in 1902. And you see that in the picture at the lower right, which is uh, uh, after she was finished working on the room. She kept the drapes, the drapes from the Truman era, uh, and the table, and the chairs from 1902. New rug, uh, new mantle. And here's the mantelpiece up a little closer, showing the inscription as it's carved in the center panel, and the, the buffalo head, the bison head at the lower right corner, uh, where Theodore Roosevelt, they, they installed the mantle in 1902, and he lived with it for six years. And just shortly before leaving office, Theodore Roosevelt said, as, she, as Mrs. Kennedy said, the lion is not an American animal, fix it. And so they had to come in and recarve the uh, lion's heads as American bison heads. She cited the great Monroe centerpiece, the, the plateau that runs down the center of the dining table during most tours. Uh, it extends to 14 and a half feet long. Uh, it has 18 classical figures that hold up the candles. Uh, one interesting story, most of the time it's only five sections on the table and there's two sections in storage. And it's a little difficult to see in this picture, but at the bottom of the plinth where the lady is in the black and white picture, it has the company's name, Dernier and Madeleine. They were the makers in France. Somehow this eluded Mrs. Kennedy's curatorial staff. They were only looking at the five sections and they actually wrote an article for Antiques Magazine attributing it to Dernier and Madeleine because of the quality of the style, not knowing that they actually had a piece of it down in the basement that was signed by the makers. But. Then she took them into the Red Room. Here you see the Red Room as it would have looked when he walked in and said, oh my, this is a very important looking room. Uh, the, the red cloth was put on the walls in imitation of fabrics that had been on the, the walls in the parlor since 1902 under Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, 
Uh, you could see the, in, comparison these two, in comparing these two pictures, uh, a lot of the same furniture remains in today's room in the lower right as was put in by Mrs. Kennedy, probably the most intact of her public rooms in terms of acquisitions remaining uh, in constant use. Uh, mostly American Empire style furniture dating from 1810 to 1830. You can see on the left hand screen the beautiful little Gary Dawn is that center table that's labeled by Charles Honoré Lanouillet. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy cited in the tour in parts that we didn't see that Lanouillet was a an important cabinet maker, uh, equally important as Duncan Fife, and made you know, truly spectacular furniture in New York. Uh, we were very lucky that Mrs. Kennedy saw Empire as something worth collecting, because the rest of the antiques world, it wasn't colonial, it wasn't sort of 18th century, maybe it really wasn't antique yet, uh, and we wouldn't be able to find a table of this quality today. She cited the sofa behind it, calling it the Dolly Madison sofa. Well, that was a mistake at the time. Uh, it really had no association with Mrs. Madison, uh, the paperwork said it was a style of the sofas Mrs. Madison had, and somewhere along the line that got translated into the paperwork coming out of the curator's office as it was Dolly Madison's sofa. But in fact, the little one in the, in the black and white picture was, did belong to Nellie Custis, who was the, uh, Washington's granddaughter. But it was fairly quickly replaced in this room by Mrs. Kennedy herself by the incredible sofa that remains there today, which is the lower right, which is the a sofa that has dolphins or sea serpents carved as the supports for the legs and the, and the arms. The blue room, as it looked in when Mrs. Kennedy took the tour in there, the heavy blue wall fabric dated from the Truman renovation of 1952. Uh, she had the Monroe furniture arriving in the room. You see on the right-hand screen the table she cited and the original chair that was given back uh, before it was reupholstered. The rather unfortunate table in the middle of the room was actually made by the carpentry shop and was just a big plywood disc uh, with a fabric covering. I think she was still working on what was gonna be the centerpiece for that room. But uh, she really didn't want this cloth to continue. She was looking for something truly more period. And you see on the left, the uh, striped wallpaper and uh, uh, decorative elements that, that, that she felt to be more in keeping with the Monroe period. But it was criticized at the time. Several people, you know, people said this, this drapery fabric running around the, the uh, cornice, it makes it look like a French lady's boudoir. Doesn't look like a formal room of the White House. But actually, she was more uh, prescient than she believed because today's room, you see on the right-hand side, that's actually a wallpaper swag that's an absolute period document that we found at the Cooper Hewitt Collection in New York of the Smithsonian's uh, Design Museum. Uh, and was installed in 1995 when the room was done again. So what you see in the room is, is different wallpaper, different upholstery, different carpeting, but the feeling of the room that Mrs. Kennedy created and that she would be absolutely thrilled, I think, to know that more historical research was going into how to keep the room looking historic. Sorry. She acquired one armchair and two side chairs for this bl blue room furniture. Uh, and you see one of the two side chairs in its current fabric. This was a fabric Mrs. Kennedy chose uh, from a portrait of President Monroe showing this wreathed eagle on it. Uh, it's gone through three different color combinations. What was interesting about this side chair is it's one of two she acquired, and it, it's, it's marked. It's a little difficult to see, but the bottom inscription is P. Belanger, who was the uh, French cabinet maker, Pierre Belanger, and it uh, exists. Unfortunately, you see what happens when people keep tacking upholstery fabrics to a frame that bears the maker's name. Uh, and so what we do today is what we call minimally invasive upholstery, where you build a, a structure inside the chair and attach all your fabrics to the new materials rather than to the old materials. The pier table that she cited as being in its original location has now moved to the entrance hall because we acquired uh, in 1979, this sofa from the set, and that was the only wall big enough to take a nine-foot-long sofa. Uh, there are now seven original pieces back in the White House of the 53 pieces that were in the original Monroe suite. And there's her chair. On the, on the left, in the Nixon-era fabric, on the right is the way the chair looks today. We found that this first chair she received was the most intact of all the chairs we know of. There are some in other museum collections as well. Uh, and so for an exhibition that we have right now at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery uh, about the decorative arts of the White House, uh, we were working on restoring the chair to its original appearance. And so it would have had red fabric, as Mrs. Kennedy told us, 
and it would have had this really high sheen, uh, polished, almost metal-like finish to its gold-leafed surface. Sorry, my finger is too fast. She was also very interested in adding to the portrait collection. Now, when she arrived at the White House, the art collection was almost exclusively portraits, but she saw the importance of getting life portraits, that portraits that had been done during the 19th century by some lesser artists or that were copies of Gilbert Stuart's uh, should be replaced. So she acquired the wonderful Thomas Jefferson at the upper left-hand corner uh, by Rembrandt Peel, painted in 1800 when he was the vice president. And then the succeeding first ladies have added to it as well. Monroe at the upper right and Madison at the lower left were acquired in the Johnson administration. Uh, Monroe by Samuel Morse, the famous inventor of the telegraph, who far preferred to be known as a great portrait painter and an artist. Uh, Mad Madison by Vanderlyn, painted when he was the president. And then in the Reagan administration, we acquired John Adams at the lower right by John Trumbull. So we've been adding portraits to the collection in consistent with Mrs. Kennedy's uh, interest in that activity. There's the green room. When she had started decorating it, it still had the heavy green fabric of the Truman renovation, a carpet with the presidential seal on it, and she'd started adding this federal style furniture of about the period 1800. Two views of that room. Here's a black and white picture of the wall that shows the uh, Daniel Webster sofa that she cited. And that's the sofa that's the upper right-hand corner. In front of the sofa is a wonderful Baltimore card table, uh, which I show at the bottom, one of my favorite, pie favorite pieces because of the incredible inlays and veneering on this piece. Uh, both of these pieces have not been used in, in the house for a while, and so we selected them as our examples of the perfection of what Mrs. Kennedy uh, was doing at the time, and they're in our exhibit at the Renwick Gallery right now. So when she got finished with the room, though, she installed this wonderful morayed silk wall fabric on the walls with her federal collection and a proper sort of period uh, Aubusson style rug. There's Miss, uh, the Angelica uh, Van Buren portrait that she cited in the tour, uh, which was over the fireplace when she gave the tour, but uh, other parts of the tour mentions that they were collecting other art, including this great portrait of Benjamin Franklin by David Martin, uh, which is over the fireplace as she intended it to be. And she moved Mrs. Uh, Van Buren, you could see, is over on, just past the chandelier on the left. The green room in the Nixon administration, it was decided that the federal furniture of Mrs. Kennedy's time was perhaps not the strongest pieces for rooms with you know, very high ceilings and, and large scale. Uh, and so it was replaced with uh, furniture made by the New York workshop of Duncan Fife about 1800 to 1810. That didn't mean it wasn't uh, some of Mrs. Kennedy's acquisitions because these wonderful curial chairs that you see at the upper right, she had acquired a set of four of those. They weren't used in the green room until the Nixon administration, but then they were perfect to be added to the collection. And also, the, in contrast, that very great Fife style in the upper right and the very simple chair at the lower left, however, this is a curator's delight because if you take the back panel off the upholstery, it was inscribed by the upholsterer and it says, stuffed by L. Ackerman, 4D Fife, purchased by S. Van Rensselaer, Albany, New York, October 1811. So most furniture doesn't get uh, that much curatorial information. And then the green room, as you see it today, this is sort of the third set of changes since Mrs. Kennedy's time. Still her silk moraid fabric has survived in each case. It's been replaced in each case, but it's been considered a key element of the room. The Nixon era furniture has largely been kept, but we've made a new rug and some new upholstery fabrics. Mrs. Kennedy was interested in improving the art collection beyond the portraits. Uh, and so what you see in, in this picture, the, the lower left painting was acquired by for Mrs. Laura Bush at her request. It's by Jacob Lawrence, a 1947 painting called the, the Builders. And she wanted it to go in the public rooms, just as Mrs. Kennedy thought that things that were new and, and, and interesting to the White House should be added to the public rooms. Uh, and so it was decided to put it in the green room. Then we had to decide, well, what, we don't own a lot of really abstract art. This might be a little bit harsh for Mrs. Kennedy's taste when she was looking for things that were early American, but the collection is growing and the interest in all periods is growing. And so what we are actually able to pair with it is this wonderful John Marin painting at the lower right, which was a Mrs. Kennedy acquisition. It was just something that she found light and easy and useful upstairs, and now it was uh, uh, ab more abstract and interesting as a, as a pair for the builders. 
Above that painting on the, the wall you see at the far left of the, the green room scene uh, is a wonderful John Singer Sargent painting called The Mosquito Net. And this was actually acquired early in the Johnson administration as a gift in memory of President Kennedy. And so I think Mrs. Kennedy would have been pleased that several great paintings were donated by uh, great collectors who wanted to remember President Kennedy and Mrs. Kennedy's contributions to the White House. The Lincoln Bedroom, as Mrs. Kennedy found it in 1961 on the left, uh, carpet had been installed in the Truman renovation. As she pointed out, the, the mirror wasn't period, the mantle wasn't period. Uh, most of the furniture was. It was still an interesting room. Uh, the lower right was how it evolved. It didn't really change very much. Uh, in the early, 19, early 2000s, it was still the 1952 carpet down on the floor after 50 years of use. Uh, the furniture, the Lincoln bed, and some of the other pieces, the wonderful center table. But this was one where uh, in 2004, First Lady Laura Bush said, could we visit a refreshing of this room and go back to the period documents and do it as right as we can? I think Mrs. Kennedy would have found that enormously gratifying because you heard her cite uh, using historic documents to try to put things in their original places and design things correctly. So it is a little bit more Victorian than it was then. But you see now the Lincoln bed with a proper recreation of its crown or its cornice, uh, wallpaper based on the Lincoln office, carpeting based on the Lincoln office, upholstery is based on uh, period things. And so it's a, it's a little bit stronger than it had been in her time, but it's still one of the principal guest bedrooms in the White House. Then she moved next door to the treaty room, what uh, they, they referred to as the Monroe room, uh, but uh, here it would have been in the 19th century when it was the president's cabinet room. Uh, you can see the sofa she mentioned in the left-hand picture at the back underneath the portrait of George Washington, the long cabinet table down the middle. And there's President Cleveland's cabinet actually meeting around it uh, in the 1890s. There's a color picture, only lightly colored, of how that uh, when she walked into the room and said this is sort of the chamber of horrors because it was so many things that weren't yet assembled and, and finalized. And then a very similar picture at the lower right of how the room was finished when she was done. She did, in fact, pick that border that came out of the uh, Peterson House, the house where President Lincoln died. And it was put on a green flocked wallpaper, uh, Victorian drapes, and put the big grant cabinet table down the middle of the room. So it stayed this way until the, uh, President George Bush's administration. And the room was starting to wear out. The fabrics were getting threadbare. And he said, you know, I like this sort of conference room idea, but I'd really rather have a private office in the private quarters where I can have more intimate meetings. And so that's the way the room has remained since then in several iterations, including uh, you can see the finished room, Mrs. Kennedy's room at the upper left, and the George W. Bush version of the office, still using the big treaty table as his, as his desk and the Grant sofa underneath the portrait of President Grant between the windows and a great painting behind the desk uh, of the signing of the peace protocol that uh, ended the Spanish-American War. And President Kennedy alluded in the full version of the, of the tape that the fact that they were not going to the West Wing, uh, but I thought I'd bring to your attention, he did mention in the tape that he sat at the famous Resolute desk. Uh, this was placed in the Oval Office by Mrs. Kennedy. It had been in the private quarters until that time, but she thought it should be the most visible desk the president would sit at. It was given to President Hayes by Queen Victoria in 1880. Uh, and it comes with two rather interesting photographs uh, for the Kennedy Library uh, grouping here. The famous one of a young John Jr. coming out through the knee hole under the desk as the president's working at it. And then a more recent photograph of Caroline in the office as President Obama tries to figure out how to go under the desk and open the door. <laughs> and the look on her face is like, please, Mr. President, just stop. But... And so the only time Mrs. Kennedy came back to the White House was for a private unveiling of her portrait and the President's portrait in the Nixon administration. She and the children came back. And uh, it was done very low key. And, uh, that was, uh, she had made her mark, and she felt that it was time now to leave the White House to her successors. And so that's what we do today, is try to, uh, our office tries to assist, along with the National Park Service and the White House Historical Association, which is also celebrating its 50th anniversary, uh, to provide the resources and the expertise necessary for each new first family to leave their mark 
on the House. And so now we'll have some questions and answers, I hope. Thank you. First, thank you so much for that wonderful tour. That was uh, wonderful to um, watch and observe. Uh, I noticed in a, a recent New York Times interview, you talked about uh, really the challenge of having this be a museum, but also a home for a family. And uh, as curator, just give us a sense of um, some of the, how you balance um, the use of the home and also maintaining it as a museum. Well, first you take a very deep breath uh, I mean, what we are and what Mrs. Kennedy knew we would be is principally in America, the official home and office for the President of the United States. Um, and so she still wanted to put great things in the room so every guest who came, whether they were tourists or invited guests, diplomatic foreign visitors, would see the best things that she could acquire that were made in America and to draw out of storage things that she could give new... Uh, importance to that had uh, survived all those unfortunate 19th century sales of White House contents. And so for us, it's the idea that the public tours probably do the least amount of damage because they're sent on a rather, you know, regimented path through the house and don't get to touch too many things. Though there are still tables along the north wall of the green room and red room that you will occasionally find chewing gum attached to the underside of the table. <laughs> um, there was the day when one lady who had the, the, the baby in the front pack, leaned over, I think actually to read the label on the wonderful John Singer Sargent painting, which I forgot to tell you the name of, it's called The Mosquito Net, uh, to read the label on it, at which point the baby reached out and grabbed the Chinese bowl on the table and threw it on the floor. You know, and the woman was mortified and had never anticipated that baby was gonna be so aggressive with the collection, but. Uh, unfortunately, it was a pair of bowls that were no longer a pair because one bowl is great, but two are better. And uh, so you have those kinds of things. At parties, though, you have sometimes you have people who just either they leave their manners at home or they don't have any. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what. Uh, you know, the butlers told us one night they walked into the blue room, the big wonderful Belanger sofa, there was a glass of red wine standing in the middle of the sofa. Now, maybe somebody got up and absentmindedly left it there, but it was just an accident waiting to happen. And, uh, or the night where they came in and said, there's a man in the red room with his feet on the sofa. And the butler was like looking at me like, what do you say? You know, how do you go in and say, excuse me, sir, you're a blank. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I said, is he sick? If he's sick and needs to lie down, we understand. But if he's Otherwise, no, that's not very good behavior. So, but it's a remarkable tribute, I think, to the early quality of early American craftsmanship that the pieces hold up. I mean, you come to a party and you sit on the chairs and you walk on the carpets and you eat off the china. Uh, we do have glass tops on most of the tables in the public rooms because it's easier to save a, a spill of an alcoholic beverage if it's rolling off the edge of the table than just sitting on it eating through the, you know, the fine finish, but uh, you have to reupholster things maybe a little bit more often than the average museum does. Uh, and we do uh, what I mentioned, the minimally invasive upholstery now where you don't actually tack to the original frame, you tack to additional materials that are added to the chairs and the sofas. Um, but there's just, a, you know, it's just sometimes you kind of scratch your head and when something happens and go, well, we couldn't have anticipated that one, could we? And, you move on, you work with conservators. We're fortunate that the National Park Service provides the White House with a furniture conservator. So just as Mrs. Kennedy was happy to have her upholstery shop where they could do work on site and not have to send things out for costly and timely repairs, uh, we have somebody that's assigned to us at our support facility who helps care for the, the furniture and, and other, mostly furniture, but other conservation needs for the house. And so. so clearly there's a difference between the public rooms and the private rooms, but one of the comparisons between the Kennedys and the Obamas is that there's now a young family living uh, in the White House. Does that change your role or the life in the White House to have teenagers and a Portuguese water dog you know, running about the premises? We've been really, really fortunate. These are great kids and a great dog. <laughs> <laughs> and there hasn't been one report of damage of any sort as a result of 
childhood exuberance or <laughs> bad doggy behavior. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, there have been times when you sort of wonder what can you say to a first lady if she picks a piece out of storage because she wants to put it in one of the children's rooms and you're kind of sitting there going, oh, can't you pick something less, val less important or less, less easily damaged? Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time, I think the first ladies and the presidents too want honest advice. They don't want things, bad things to happen on their watch. They really don't. I mean, that's why there's, the public rooms are administered partly by our office, but also by the Committee for the Preservation of the White House, which was created by President Johnson, uh, basically to replace Mrs. Kennedy's Fine Arts Commission with a more formally structured organization. And their goal is to preserve the rooms and prevent the family from getting blamed for change. If change is made because we collectively have decided on it, it still shouldn't be blamed on the First Lady. It should be, it should be the committee's responsibility to take the, you know, the, whatever heat might come from the press. And so, uh, but the private quarters are still things that are in the White House collection. And so we still have to deal with the fact that, and what, that those things go up there. And in some cases, I think the fact that we don't dispose of anything, we don't deaccession anything from our collection now, uh, is so that you know, a new first family can come in and maybe they'll like to pick a Truman renovation reproduction table rather than the Duncan Fife table to put next to the bed with the water glass on it so that if you knock it over in the middle of the night, you don't come up with a damaged table in the morning. We'll begin uh, to take questions from the audience in just a minute, so if you have them, please line up at the microphone. So they mentioned 1.3 million visitors uh, back um, 50 years ago. How many visitors do you have now that come through on the public tours? I think the numbers now are about 700,000, and that doesn't reflect a, a loss of President Kennedy's optimism for twice that many. I don't think we could handle twice that many. I really don't. Uh, but after September 11th, 2001, the White House closed. I mean, we were not open to tours at all, and then it was gradually reopened. And so now, the old habit of, in the, well, original days, you just lined up at the fence line, and if you were in line by noon, you got in on the tour. Uh, after that, they decided giving out time tickets so that you could not spend your whole morning standing along the fence, uh, would allow you to do other things. But uh, it's required now that you have to go to your congressperson and submit information to be cleared through the Secret Service database. Uh, so it's cut down maybe not quite 50% on the visitation, but still you know, most museums and historic sites would die for 700,000 visitors a year. So uh, we're still the most visited historic house in the world, I think. We have a question here. In the original broadcast, um, Mrs. Kennedy showed a, uh, a shop in which upholstering was done actually on site. And I was wondering, uh, were there other craftsmen where pieces were sent out for work to be done in, in other locations in any, during Mrs. Kennedy's uh, overseeing of the, the, the renovation? Yeah. I, I, and if so, is there a way actually to, uh, to find out or any, any way to actually research that? My grandparents had an upholstery business, um, reupholstery business and renovation, um, furniture renovation. Um, and it's always been said within my family that um, they did some, you know, work, maybe, you know, just a piece, I don't know. Yeah. So it's always been, a, you know, something I've been interested in, to try and research to find out if there's any It's possible. Record. I mean, it's really, I mean, there was, it wasn't just exclusively done by Larry Arada in, in the cabinet making shop. They would have used uh, some outside sources, especially when they were making like the reproduction chairs for the Blue Room. You know, that was done by a, a, an outside firm and then would have probably been sent to an outside upholster to do a, a whole batch job. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, it's, um, we're welcome to have a, an, inquiry, an inquiry and we'll look back at the files. It doesn't mean that the paperwork back then was quite as thorough as we might be today. Yeah. Uh, not that they weren't trying, but they were just kind of overflowing with things happening at the time. Uh, because there's lots of things. People come to us all the time with, I mean, not related to your question exactly, but the story that grandmother always said this piece came from the White House. Uh, and, you know, we know there were sales and we know this is possible and we try to answer them as thoroughly as we can that we can't say for certain, but we can't deny in a, in a lot of cases. In well, I don't some think cases, my grandparents we, were very good record keepers. I mean, you know, whatever they might have, like, maybe the history detectives, you know, could help. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question over here. 
Uh, yes, I'm, inter I'm interested if you have any stories of um, VIPs perhaps trying to take souvenirs home with them <laughs> and how um, your staff deals with that. Well, <laughs> you stop putting demi tasse spoons on the table that say President's House on it <laughs> because that's the last course and the butlers won't pick the demi tasse cups up until the guests have left the table. So you can't monitor that they're putting the fancy little spoons with the words President's House on it in their pockets. That's one way. <laughs> I mean, there have been some stories that I can't absolutely confirm of political figures putting a tray down their pants uh, to try to escape with a, a piece of silver. Um, you know, every year we, we were required by law to do an annual inventory of everything in the house. Now, we have 50,000 objects in our collection, probably 30,000 is tableware, because we count every knife, fork, spoon, glass, plate, dish. Uh, and some are missing, and some may be breakage, and some may have gone down the garbage disposal, and some may have gone in the trash, uh, and then some may have been purloined. It doesn't mean if, if there are collectors of presidential China who often have things that are absolutely fine for them to have, because prior to recent times, uh, people, you know, they, if a China service got broken down until there were too few pieces, they would have sold it in the 19th century or given it away. Actually, I've had a, 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 a collector one time tell me President Kennedy tried to give him the cup and saucer they were drinking out of in the Oval Office, and he was like, no, Mr. President, that's the White House's. So, again, I can't confirm that story. That's a secondhand story, but uh, I think uh, the President and First Ladies are very careful with things today, and, but we have a lot of guests. Question here. Um, I have two questions that are related. One, um, did Mrs. Kennedy have a curator such as yourself um, in house when she was there? And two, she mentions um, a, a painting that was borrowed from the Boston Museum in the dining room. And I know there are a number of other paintings borrowed from various collections in her time. Is that something that she innovated, and is it being carried on today? Yes, she had a curator. She was the, it was Lorraine Pierce. She was borrowed from the Smithsonian. Uh, she worked for about a year, and, and then there's been four curators before me after her, so I'm, what if that makes me sixth in the line? Uh, so there's been some curatorial presence ever since Mrs. Kennedy started the museum program and said we have to have a, at least one professional person. She actually had two other women working with the Rain Pierce because they were receiving letters and objects and offers of things and donations and they you know, needed to process the same way we do today uh, to keep you know, uh, the best possible records and do the research uh, to try to document whether they wanted something or not. Um, the borrowing of paintings happens uh, she was the first person, well, no, she wasn't the first person, because we had had loan, probably had loan paintings in the Eisenhower and Truman administrations too, from, usually from the National Gallery or someplace in Washington. Uh, I think maybe the Boston Museum was her Massachusetts contacts, had a, a, an option there. She hung those two paintings in the, in the state dining room, and that's the only time there's been more than one painting in the state dining room. That portrait of Lincoln is the principal object, art object in the room. In fact, the walls where she hung those paintings, the, the sconces had been hung on the pilasters, and they've since been moved to the walls where they seem to better belong. And so now there's actually no room in the room to hang another painting. But we continue to borrow as needed. Sometimes it's to meet the tastes of the first families, usually for the private quarters. We try to have the public rooms focus on our permanent collection, the things that belong to the nation for the White House. Uh, the only exception on the state floor is a portrait of Mrs. Monroe that belongs to the Monroe family, and we haven't managed to talk them into donating it to us yet, and so it's still on loan since 1970. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, but the same thing was true of Dolly Madison. Our great Scoobert Stewart portrait of her was on loan from the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts from 1970 until 1996 when we finally talked a museum into selling us a work out of their collection because they finally said, wait a minute, it belongs in the White House. Uh, and so much better than it did in their collection. Uh, so mostly what we borrow now is, is frequently to, to meet 
like this administration, President Obama, are very interested in abstract art, you know, modern art that we just don't have in our collection yet. And uh, so there are paintings that we've borrowed from the National Gallery, the Hirshhorn Museum uh, in Washington that for the private quarters that, and the Oval Office that fulfill their desires. Last question. I actually, I actually have two, if you don't mind. Um, my first question is under which president since uh, John F. Kennedy has there been the most change to the White House? Actually, the Nixon administration was probably the largest number of objects acquired, even more than the Kennedy administration. Uh, Mrs. Nixon very much admired what Mrs. Kennedy had done and wanted to improve the collection, increase the collection, and take very little credit for it. Mrs. Kennedy had already set the, the path. You know, she didn't need to go out and ask people to donate uh, as much because Mrs. Kennedy set the standard for what every first lady could then rely on the public understanding. Um, so. To, uh, she hired a curator, uh, the man who actually hired me for my job in subsequent years, and uh, uh, they worked very hard. And so they kept a lot of Kennedy things in some of the rooms, and they changed out some Kennedy things in other rooms. But all the pieces are ours permanently, and, and they will come back into use from time to time as different first ladies and presidents choose from them. Um, my second question is on the art collection. Um, it was interesting when you were talking about the builders and how you paired that painting uh, which is more modern with a uh, slightly more traditional. And as uh, taste change and we get further and further away from the modern art period and more contemporary art, how do you mix in pieces from that time period which might not necessarily match with the style of some of the rooms in the house? I don't think we're as locked into style issues as people once were perhaps. I mean, there were plenty of paintings going in these rooms that were 50, 60 years later than the style of the room, but because they were traditional paintings, they were sort of accepted as being all right. Uh, you know, when, the, when Mrs. Kennedy's portrait arrived, it was exceptionally controversial. I mean, Aaron Schickler painted that very impressionistic, full-length, uh, a picture of Mrs. Kennedy that showed at the end that, uh, you know, I mean, some people, when it first arrived, we had people saying, it looks like she's wearing her pajamas. <laughs> you know, she looks like a ghost. I mean, it was, it was a hard picture for people to accept at the beginning because it was a new and an unusual style for a portrait. Uh, I think we're going to have, you know, that day when we want to hang Jackson Pollock in the green room and we're going to have to decide, you know, is that okay? It, it, I think really it's going to be the scale of modern art more than the style of modern art that may be the hindrance for us. Is, you know, do you want to give up an entire wall to one painting when you can hang, otherwise hang two to four paintings in the same space? And so uh, it, it'll come, maybe not on my watch, but not because I object to it, just because I, <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to be there when the great Jackson Pollock arrives. So Bill, we don't want to uh, promote any um you know, hidden secrets that don't truly exist that the way sometimes when you watch national treasure movies, um, uh, there are secret compartments <laughs> behind desks. And, but the next time all of us go to the White House, what, what's one small thing that you might have us look for that the normal visitor might not know? One, one intricacy or specialty of the house that only the curator would have us um, take a look hmm. to see? Wow. That's kind of like the question, what's your favorite object in the house? You know, it's like, well, on 9-11-2001, my favorite object would have been something I could carry under my arm when the Secret Service told us, get out, um, which was obviously not going to be George Washington or the portrait of Theodore Roosevelt. So I thought, well, it probably would be that wonderful Thomas Jefferson by Rembrandt Peale, except then I'd probably get shot for being a looter on the street if I still was seen coming out of the White House. So, um, hmm, that's a tough one. I'll tell a story on the, the painting I showed you, the John Singer Sargent of the Mosquito Net, because it's a great painting. It was in Sargent's collection until his, his death. And uh, it's a friend asleep under a mosquito net. But it hangs in a room where most of the portraits are presidents or first ladies. And it's obviously a depiction of a person. And with this black mosquito net draped over their heads, the, most times the people will come in and say, which first lady is dying in that painting? <laughs> because they assume it's some kind of a shroud or something. 
If you go in the red room, there's two wonderful sconces that flank the big Albert Bierstadt over the sofa on the east wall. They have eagles, and the eagle holds a, ball, a chain in its mouth with a ball on the end. And, people, and they were made in England. Basically, after the revolution, again, after the War of 1812, the English realized, you make it with eagles, the Americans will buy it. You know, it doesn't matter if we were at war, commerce is more important. And so, you know, people ask all the time, what does it mean? You know, what does this ball and chain mean? And, you know, people have said, is it casting off the chains of British tyranny in the American Revolution? Is it linking itself to the world community? Uh, but one of our tour officers, now these are members of the United States Secret Service, so you try not to criticize them too heavily, when asked that question, now these are about 12, 13 feet apart. When someone said, what does it mean? This fellow, and I was actually in the room at the time and witnessed him say it. He said, you pull the two chains simultaneously and flush all the toilets in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> and a room full of tourists went, wow. <laughs> and I'm in the back of the room going, no. <laughs> So that's just so the look kind of for the sconces. That we Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Bill. Um, <laughs> that was great.